Okay, so we mentioned a little bit about tzedakah, or meister, I should say, giving a tenth or up to a twentieth. So there's a, four, a, a couple of important points. I just want to uh, talk about that before we continue in the Gemara. So the Archashokhan in Simon Reish Mem Tess says that some people claim from this Gemara, so there's a mitzvah of tzedakah, but what their Gemara here was talking about is meister, giving a tenth. Tosos points out from Yushalmi that if you never gave tzedakah before, you'd give 10% on your principal wealth. And then going forward, you would give on what what your your finances for every year from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. And they mentioned if you if you have some things that you make money on and some things you lose money on, you wait for the whole year and you figure out the net gain and you give and after well, we're not talking about necessarily taxes here, but yeah, probably after taxes. But I'm saying, let's say you made some investments. You had a deal, you found a deal on, on black cloth. So you bought black cloth, that became a big seller. Then you had a you had a, a, a big box of, of, of cherries, and then you couldn't sell the cherries. You lost money on the cherries. The meaning, so if you had, so you don't have to worry about giving tzedakah, oh, I just made this deal, let me give a mice right away. Well, you might have something that you're going to lose money on. So you wait for the year and you pay for the year. So, but this idea that people talk about, I have to give my miser. So is my, so the Archa says some quote from this Gemara that miser is Midi Raisa. The Archa does not like that at all. He completely rejects that. So the Archa Shulchan points out there's a mitzvah of tzedakah. And then there's this Durabanan of miser. And this Durabanan of miser is, um, when, when we learned about from Meiser, Aser to Aser, give a tenth and another tenth, that's not a real drasha. That's just a way to remember what this Takanas Chachamim was. But it's absolutely not a drasha, according to the Rosh Hashanah. He also points out that... Uh, yes, what about if there would be someone super rich, and let's say with 6% of his money, he could he could pay for all of the... Poor people. Does that mean that no? That and and if it's deraisa, everyone else would still have to give tzedakah. But who do they have to give this tzedakah to? So the Archeshulchan says there's no such Torah requirement to give the uh, uh, up to twenty percent, but you have to give day machsora what the aniyim are lacking. Then he says, and this it's we don't know historically. He says that nowadays in Gullus, there's a lot of more poor people than there were in the time of the Beis Hamikdash when we were in our land and control of our land. So whether that's true or not, the the Ramban in Parshas Re'ei brings someone, I thought that he said himself, but I looked it up, and he, he doesn't say it, he mentions someone who mentions that when the Patsy says in Re'ei, because we will not cease from having a poor person in the land. So the Ramban mentions, many commentators said that uh, the poor people will not end from the land at any time. There will always be poor people in the land because it was revealed before Hashem that they're not going to do what they're said uh, because there won't be a poor person if you listen to Hashem. So it seems, it's a little strange, it seems that I think the Ramban I, I saw had a slightly different text than this, but so I mean this is this is a little bit difficult from the from the free will perspective. Hashem knew that not everyone was going to listen to him, therefore he said in the Torah, Lo eleven There's never going to we're never going to cease from having poor people. So from this it sounds like if there if people do all the mitzvot, they're not going to be poor. which we could explain with other explanations from the Ramban from different places to make it make sense. Like for in Parshas Bechukosa, he says that in the time of the Nevi'im, if you were sick, you didn't go to a doctor. You went to a Navi. You said, what am I doing wrong? Obviously, Hashem sent me the sickness as a message. Help me figure out what I had, what, what did I do wrong? Or a different Ramban about Maka, the, the fence around your flat roof. He says, if you're a tzaddik, laws of nature don't apply to you. If you would fall off from the roof, you'd be fine. But it's only for people who aren't tzaddikim are subject to the nature. 
so then like Rabbi Hanina ben, uh, ben Dosa was so poor and his and they didn't have his wife put vinegar instead of oil in either because she didn't have or uh, for the candles for Shabbos and he said just like Hashem can make uh, oil uh, um, light a fire he can make vinegar burn so a nace happened and and the vinegar burned as if it was oil so the Ramban said in other places so that's a little bit different than than this that that's about the laws of nature but it seems. The Ramban is bringing opinions. This isn't his opinion. He's mentioning opinions that say that if people would follow the mitzvot, they wouldn't be poor. So it seems that the punish that that to these opinions, some of some uh, at least some poor people, their poverty comes for, as a punishment for something. But we know, but other places, uh, the the end of the first parakim kedushin, schar mitzvah b'hay olam leka. There's no reward in this world. We don't know what's a reward, what's a punishment, what's uh something that just happens, uh, that it's not a direct message from Hashem. It's it's hard to know. But the Ramban rejects this. That's not correct. The Torah is hinting about in the future, but it's not saying that, the Torah is not saying that there's is that there's people who are not going to finish the Torah for, for at, at all times. Chas v'shalom. And may and and the Torah is just saying sometimes you'll have poor people and you'll have to support the poor, poor people. So, but the the Archa Shulchan says that in the time of the Beis Hamikdash when we were in control of our land, so probably not during the Roman time, during Hanukkah time, but when we were in control of the land and the Beis Hamikdash, there weren't poor people. So it's not it, how could you say that everyone had to give at least 10% of their, 10% uh, to Tzedakah if there weren't that many poor people. So he says that that this is a later enactment and it's Midr Abana. Then he said, then a different point that's important to mention The Ramah mentions that you can't spend from your miser money for a mitzvah, like for uh, candles in the in the shul or another dar mitzvah, you have to give it to a poor person. But if you have to be a sandik or to give to a, a new mother or expenses for a bris mila if, if, if you're poor or if you give for achnasas kala and things like this, that would be included in miser. So let's say you had a mitzvah, uh, you... you uh, you were marrying off your own kid, or you were, uh, you had a baby, so to pay for the bris, things like that. That could be your own meiser money for that own mitzvah thing. The shach says, and uh, also if you buy an aliyah for to the Torah and you give a nidava to the base Amet, for to the base of medrash or the base of knesses, that could also be for meiser. Or if you give from tzedakah to people who serve the community. That's included in tzedakah. And it appears to me, says the Archa Shulchan, that uh, when you give to, let's say, the Rav, when his son gets married or his daughter, when she gets married, that's not considered maisa, maiser. That's considered expenses for a, a wedding. But if you give it when it's being when collections are happening for collections for aniyim, then it is considered maiser. Uh, he also writes, the Ramah also writes, that it's much better to give your maiser money to your grown sons if they need that, even though you don't have to support your grown sons, or to your father, you're allowed to pay them from the most miser, the miser money if your father is poor, certainly for your sons. But this is doubtful, says the Archa Shulchan, because in Kedushin, uh, there, there's a Gemara in Kedushin that it's very dist distasteful if you give your miser ani, which is the second tithe in the years three and five that go to a poor person, to your father. Uh, so he discusses that. So and he also doesn't, some say that you could buy Svarim to learn with your Meiser money, and he doesn't like this because if so, you could buy Tefillin and Tzitzis with that. And then you, uh, on the condition that other people are allowed to use it also, so then you could buy an astro and a chauffeur and, and the condition that other people could use it. And that's 
going to include Miser. So Argamar mentioned here. Did we see that yet? Base, base, base. Where's base? Oh, no, it's later on. So we'll talk about that in a, in a in a few minutes, but but the, these type of shalos are uh It seems according to the shachar or the ramah, some some of these things would be allowed to be given from Iser. And if that's true, he doesn't say it, but it's it's hard to justify it from from a tzedaka perspective if it's an obligation of tzedaka. If Miser is a separate obligation besides for tzedaka, it makes it like, makes more sense. You would have certain greater latitude to give for these types of causes, which aren't necessarily for someone else. You give tzedakah to yourself. I know we like to say charity begins at home, but that doesn't mean you're a kind tzedakah when you give money from this pocket into this pocket. A lot of options. If you have a specific shayla, we could ask the specific shayla and pass it on the specific shayla. Yeah, I mean, I've heard that there's lots of leeway nowadays. Uh, uh, you know, some people obviously use it as a way of <laughs> decreasing their uh, their real tzedakah. Right, I have to pay my kids tuition. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that's a similar thing to that. Yeah. So if you hold that miser is is a diraisa, so that it's I I I see it as a difficult way to stay that you could be give the tzedakah to yourself. If as the Archashulchan Paskins, that Meiser is a separate rabbinic obligation than Tzedakah, it makes more sense. There's more leeway. The Shittim Kubetzas brings an opinion here. Um, No, it's not here. Where did I see it? I thought it was in the Shittim Kubetzas. I thought I saw the Shittim Gubetzas, an opinion that this drush of Aser to Aser was a Diraisa, but I don't see it now, so I can't quote it. But it would seem that the opinions that the Archa Shulchan mentions, he doesn't mention them by name here, that th those opinions who hold that it's the Arisa would hold that it is Midiraisa. So he mentions in the name of the Bach and the Chubas Pnei Yoshua. So he doesn't mention the name of Arisha, only the name of Achrona. So that's a few things about Tzedakah. When the Lubavitcher Rebbe was sitting Shiva, I think, for his wife. So somehow there's some video, three and a half minutes. Well, it's audio, but they put on YouTube of Ravaron. When Ravaron was in Menachem Avel, he was talking about Sadaka. And uh, there's a Safri that if a poor person, money fell out of his pocket, he didn't know about it, and a poor person picked it up, the the, the person who lost the money was Mekayim Sadaka, even if he didn't know that he was losing the money. And uh, Ravar mentioned in share. And he was mentioning that sheet to Lubavitcher Rebbe during this shiva there, and that's on. Uh, so when I when somehow I came across it randomly, I sent it to Ramosha because Naftali, Ramosha's son Naftali, loves uh, watching or listening to things about his eighty, and even though it's in Yiddish, he doesn't understand the Yiddish. So he already had he already knew about it, and he listened to it a lot. 
They hear Zadie talking in Yiddish. Okay, so we are at Amar of Simi Bar Ashi. So it's like the last, second to last paragraph on 50A1 in the art scroll. And it is about 12 or 13 lines from the top of Nun Amad Aleph, the third to the last word on the line. Amar of Simi Bar Ashi. So unfortunately, I brought up this point last time, but I hadn't gotten further enough in the Gemara. So the three statements that Rav, Rav Ila had, had given. The first one I said was the name of Reish Lakish, the name of someone else. The middle one was only in the name of Reish Lakish. And the third one, he just said himself that in Usha there was a Takana. So I pointed out that the first one, he said the name of Reish Lakish, who said the name of someone else. The second one was only the name of Reish Lakish. The third statement, he said himself, not in the name of anyone. So Rav Simi points out, Ushmua's Lolo Mismatos these These teachings, I mean, Shmua is literally something you heard, they got reduced meaning because we went from his name in the name of two others to in the name of one and, and not in the name of anyone. And we have a mnemonic for it that the uh, ketanim, so children, kasvu, rot, uvizvizu, and spread out the money. So one, the first one that was in the name of three people was ketanim. The middle statement was about writing and this case about the tzedakah is Amr of Yitzchak. Now Rav Yitzchak says, "Be'ush eskinu in Usha they made a takana she'adam is gagling b'no ad shdemes reishana." A person, a man, has to be patient with his son until he's twelve years old. V'kan ve'elach yard ima b'chaya. From here on, he can go into his life. What does that mean? So Rashi says that. Up until he's 12, if he so Rashi says if he refuses from learning, you have to be gentle and uh, physically and and be soft in words to try to encourage him. So when it says learning, it it probably includes learning a trade also, because Rashi in Makos and other places talks about that it's a mitzvah or it's an obligation. Well, there's a Rashi in Makos, but the main Gemara is in in Kedushin, that just a father has to teach his son. A Torah, but he also has to teach his son a profession. So it probably means whether you're trying to teach him Torah when he's younger than 12 or a profession, uh, 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 till he's 12, you you can't be forceful or or mean. It has to be gentle and encouraging language. But from 12 on, then Yordi Mablachayev, Rashi says that you can hit him with a, with a, a strap and by withholding food from him or reducing food from him. So if he's not listening by age 12, then you could take more extreme physical measures. So Eni, is this true? Rav Rav Shmuel Bar Shalas. Rav said to Rav Shmuel Bar Shalas, don't accept a student who's less than six years old. Barshis Kabel Uspele Kisora. If he's six, you could receive him and stuff him like an ox, meaning force feed him. Nowadays, we would say feed it like a goose for foie gras, meaning make the kid learn as much as he can, even if he doesn't want to. So even though the, the Gemara says if he uh, our, uh, so so the question was, so Rav Yitzhak said that in Ul in, in Usha they said you can't force him to learn until he's 12. How come here you're stuffing him with Torah even if he doesn't want to? Uh uh from the time he's six. So the Gemara says, in, Sve like a Torah. You should stuff him like an ox. So I guess like an ox in our days, besides for the foie gras, you be like a veal. A young, uh, when you're, you're you're feeding the veal, so they get big and fat. So you're trying to force feed the, the Torah into the kid. Shana. But there's a difference between force, forcing him to learn and trying to stuff as much Torah you can into him versus taking physical measures against him. You're still not allowed to use these physical measures against him uh, until he's 12 years old. Or I could explain it in a different way. When it talks about you have to teach the student from when he's six years old, that means Tanakh. But when it's 12, that's for Mishnah. So you can't force him when he's learning Mishnah until 
Uh, he's twelve. Which we're gonna be, we're gonna come to that. Yes, the Amr Abaye. So we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes in a slightly different context. But yeah, there's the mission of Kevos. Ben Chamesh Shanim Lemikra, five years old for Mikra. Ben Esr Shanim Lemishna, ten years old for Mishnah. Ben Chamesh Israeli Gemara, fifteen years for Gemara. We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. But the the ages don't match up completely. But we're gonna see something. The Gemara. Some try to um synthesize this Gemara with that mission of Perkei Avos, and some say it's slightly different cases, so they, we don't have to synthesize them. The Amr Abai, because Abai says, Amr Li Aim, we saw this earlier, when uh, Abai was orphaned, his mother died when he when he was born, but there was a maidservant who who raised him, and he called her Aim. Bar Mikra, for six years old, you should teach him Chomish, or in Tanakh, Ben Esr Le Mishnah. When he's 10, you should teach him Mishnah. Bar Tleis or Letanis Ames Le Ace. And when he's 13, he's, he could fast for 24 hours. Or Betinokis Bas Tracer. And for a girl, when she's uh, when she's 12. So, so the Abaye statement from his maid who, who raised him is supporting the fact that. Um, we might have to, that you might, you teach, that you would teach the kid at certain ages. And we see that there's a difference between teaching them at a certain age, even if they don't necessarily want to, but that doesn't mean, talk about anything about uh, using, using physical force. Okay. So then here by the Derek Agav, we come into the thing. When is a kid supposed to fast? Let's say for Yom Kippur or for Tishba. Obviously the only tinest derisa that we have, well, the only tinest deraisa is Yom Kippur. If there's an ace tsara, if there's a time where there's calamities falling the community, the 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 leaders of the community could call a fast day, and so when you would fast, it'd probably be a kiyomi deraisa of Tfila of Yom Simchaschem of Madechem. When uh, uh, and there is a trouble with tsara tsoreschem of Ariosim bechatzotros. We also mentioned many times, not recently though, about the Mamados. That uh, the as the Rambam says, how is it possible that that when when you bring a korban, you have to be davening, or or let's say you did an avera chas v'shalom. So when you bring a, a, a korban, you have to do a vidoy. The Rambam says in Uh Shuva, uh, if you get punished by basin because you did something wrong, you have to do your vidoy also to as part of your tshuva. So. If, if if the korbanos are being brought on our behalf in the base of Mikdash, the person the bala the bala korban has to daven when the korban when the korban is being uh, offered that the korban should be accepted. So because of that, there were certain people who were designated that they went to Yushalayim and they fasted uh, some of the days of the week and they had special uh, kriyas Torah and special davening that they did on behalf of all Klal Yisrael. I think they had what two weeks at a time or was it one week at a time? I don't remember right now, but um, so their part of their davening on behalf of Klai Yisrael was fasting also. It was at the Raisa. No, it's not the Raisa. So when do you have to tr uh, tr uh, train a kid? So a little Gemara is here. There's also a little bit about this in the last perk of Yuma. So some say when they're kid, just train them, you know, to have breakfast an hour later. You don't really have to train. We say Lashaus for hours, but it doesn't necessarily mean when they're 10, have them fast till 10 a.m. And when they're 12, have uh, when they're 11, have them fast till noon. It doesn't necessarily mean that some might interpret it that way, but according to this Gemara, you don't have to have them fast. It seems a boy when he so in his thirteenth year, so within a year of his bar mitzvah, he should fast. And for a girl in her twelfth year, because she's a becomes a bas mitzvah when she's twelve, so the fast before she should she should fast. Uh. Uh. The full fast. So the Ritva here mentions. So, and this is bringing in the, um, what Jeff pointed out. When it says that when he's six, you should send him to school. Does that mean the beginning of the sixth year? So when he's five years old, that's his sixth year now. So that's when he should start learning Chumash. So when Argamar says six, it doesn't mean his sixth birthday, which is his seventh year of life, but it means right after his fifth birthday when it's his six years of life. That's what you're asking, right? 
So some explain it that way, but others explain it that when you send him to school, he should be six full years old, meaning his seventh year. And so in that case, the mission in Pirkei Avos is not uh, uh, along the same lines of thought as this Gemara. And the mission of Pirkei Avos is talking about the father should start teaching him. And here is talking about sending him to the school. Now, the schools were a, a newer takana. The Gemara in what? Daf Chafala for Chafbez and Baba Basra says there's a certain man he should be recognized for good, Ben Gamla. I think Yeshua Ben Gamla, because everyone knew that a father has an obligation to teach his, to his kid Torah. What about, what about boys who didn't have a father to teach them? Whether the father didn't know or the father passed away or father went to Medina Sayyam, what would happen? So Ben Gamla, uh, instituted that there should be a, what we would call public school. And so everyone was able to learn. So so, uh, so when the Ritva here saying some say to send them to school, that must be after the Takana of Ben Gamla. So then when it talks about 13 for a fast, so Rashi says that means in the 12th year, because if it's after her 12th birthday, she's already obligated to fast because she's a gadola. She's a, a halachic adult. So when it says uh, 13 for a boy and 12 for a girl, it must be the 13th year for, for a boy and the 12th year for a girl before his 13th birthday, before her 12th birthday. So if the 12 and 13 means bef means the, the year, then it would make more sense, but the Ritva doesn't say that those opinions match. They don't have to interpret that that uh, when he six goes to school means in his fifth year. So even though you might think from the Mishnah Prayer there should be a consistency, the Ritva does not seem to say that there has to be such a consistency. But the Ritva points out is that the fact that you fast a girl when she's 11 and a boy when he's 12, they fast on Yom Kippur to practice, that's not a Dindi Raisa. It's only a, a Durabana. No, the year before the Bar Mitzvah, they say you, they say you should fast. But some people, it seems, think that's a Diraisa. Uh, but uh, the Ritva here says it's not Midi Raisa. It's only Midi Rabana. But it seems that besides, normally there's a Mitzvah of Chinuch, meaning... A kid before bar mitzvah doesn't have to do mitzvahs, but we have them do mitzvahs so they'll be prepared when they become 13 and they have to do mitzvahs. They'll know what to do and they'll be used to doing it, so it won't be a problem. So some say that in regard to fasting, fasting when you're 12 because of this Gemara is its own thing. Meaning it's not it's not just practicing to fast so you'll be able to fast when you're bar mitzvah or bas mitzvah, but it's a slightly different thing. Some people say that. Uh, from the ritva, it doesn't, doesn't seem that way. Well, this uh, uh, Yom Kippur Katan. Yom Kippur is something completely else. Yom Kippur Katan is just that the day Erev Rosh, Erev Rosh Chodesh would be a special day for davening. So some people fasted, and uh, and because they fasted, it became like a minor fast day, a voluntary minor fast day, and so they would lane at Mincha, and they would say Vidoy and things like that at Mincha. So but what we would have similar to that is if people would fast on Bahab, on the Monday, Thursday, Monday, after the Rosh Chodesh, after Sukkot and Pesach, it would be a similar thing. At Mincha, would be you would read with the Torah if you have a minion uh, fasting. Yom Kippur Khan is no basis from a Torah level. I don't, I don't know when it started, but it's it's a much more recent uh, thing, and it's about a Yom Tfil, a, 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 a small day of tshuva. Why they picked Yom Kippur Khan, I don't know. It's probably some Kabbalah reason. I don't know. So did you maybe you saw some things that some... Uh, Rabbi said that this past Monday, Erev Rosh Chodesh, fast if you can, and then if you have a minion, uh, we'll read the Torah, and, and they did that at the CRC, at the, the Mincha at the CRC on Monday, they they uh, had created the Torah. That's what Yom Kippur Katan is. And so one other thing, Rashi points out that Rav Shmuel Bar Shelas was, uh, was a Rebbe, a teacher of children. So, uh, so Rav told Rav Shmuel Bar Shelas, a halachic thing, teach the kids, stuff them up with Torah, even if they don't necessarily want to, but you 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 shouldn't force them, you can't use physical force when they're that young. 
Amar Abaye. So once we had Abaye quoting his. Oh, wait. So it was one other thing. What's mitzvah? I think there's one other thing to mention. Let me find out, remember it right now. I think I wrote it down. No. Okay. So I can't find it. Okay. Amar Bay Abaye said, Amrli Aim, the woman who raised me, taught me Hai Barshis de Takrale Akraba, a six year old who's bitten by a scorpion. Bioma de Mishlam Shis, if it's on the day that he that it he, his that it's his sixth birthday that he completed six year, Lochai, he's not going to live unless he has the proper cure. Maya Suse. So what is this cure? Mararta de Daya Hivarta Bishifra, the bile of a white vulture with bear, Nafshev and Nashke, rub it on. On him and have him drink uh, have him drink it. Hi, Barshata de Targle Zibura. If a one year old, a shata is a year. So Barshata, one year old, was bitten by a bee. So a Dalit and a Zion can interchange. So Zibura is like a Devora. The Yom the Mishnah Shata, the year that it's his one year old and his first birthday, Lochai is not gonna live from this bee sting. Maya Suse, what do you have to do? Atzvasa de Dikla Bamaya. So date palm best with water. So the the uh, the art scroll says it's a woody fiber that grows around date palm trees. So because a dikla is a date palm, so you 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 uh, soak that in water. Nashve vinashke, rub some of it and have him drink some of it. Okay, I'm Rav Katina. Rav Katina says, says pachos mi ben sheish. If someone will uh, enter his kid to learn Torah when he's less than six, rats achrav magia. Can run after him, but is not going to reach him. What does this mean? Rashi says, Rats Achrav, you could run after him to keep him healthy, uh, but you're not going to be successful. He's put in danger to die because of the weakness. Ikeda Amri some say, Haverav Rats and Achrav, if his fellow, the, his friends, the other kids will run after him, the Ain Magian Liada. So the Ika da Amri says that other kids are going to try to match him, his Torah learning, but they're not going to be successful. So the first statement says that if the kid learns when he's younger than six, he's going to be weak and sick. The second one says he's going to be so successful in learning, the other kids who started a little bit later than him are not going to catch up to his learning. But Shavayu is nihu, and both things are true. Chalish v'gamir, the kid will be weak, but he's going to be knowledgeable in the Torah. And Ibois Ema, or we could say that Hadikachish, the case where the kid is going to be getting sick is where he's a weak kid to begin with. And so you shouldn't start him learning when he's young. But Hadibari, but when he's young, you should start him when he's very healthy, you should start him young, and he'll be successful that the other kids who didn't start as young as he is won't be able to catch up to him. So uh, there's a very interesting. Rav Zabin brings down in, in Rus. Something in the name of the Vilna Gaon. I don't think I saw the the Vilna Gaon inside, but he says.
Okay, certain details of, I'm reading here from uh, the Festivals in Halakha by Rav Zevin. This is page 298 in the Art Scroll English volume. Certain details of the process of conversion are derived in the Gemara from the conversion of Rus. Abraisa and Gemara Yavamo says we inform the prospective gear of a few of the less grave commandments and a few of the stricter commandments. We do not overburden him with numerous mitzvos, nor are we exacting with him in the fine details. The Gemara comments, Rabbi Lazar said, what is this based on? The Pasuk says, and we saw that she was making an effort to go with her and she stopped speaking to her. Meaning, when uh, Naomi told Rus, go back, and Naomi kept not not going back. So event, so when Naomi said that she was staying, she stopped convincing her to go back. So we learn that you, that, uh, so some say, but Rabbi Reese wrote an article about this about 10 years ago, or, uh, uh, that people know, you know, one of the things that everyone knows, you know, you you have to convince a gear, you tell, try to tell a gear three, a per, perspective gear three times, not to be a convert to convert, and if they keep coming back a fourth time, then you take them. So Rabbi Reese wrote an article before it was in Chicago about ten years ago, I think, uh, trying to find a source for that. But what, but from this Gemara, it says that that Rus was trying to convince uh, Naomi was telling her to go away, and when she didn't, she stopped trying to convince her to go away. So it doesn't say anything about three times in that Gemara. So the Gemara says that Naomi said, we're prohibited on Shabbos and Yantif to go beyond the, the 2000 Amma Tchum Shabbos. So Rus said, where you walk, I will walk. Then she said, where there's an Isra of Yichud. You can't be secluded in the same room as a man unless you're married to him. So Rus said, where you sleep, I will sleep. Meaning, because what are the things? How Rus said, where you walk, I walk. Where you sleep, I will walk. And there I will be buried. What the, has with walking and sleeping and burying have to do with anything? So the Gemara says they were having a conversation. And the Ami would tell her something. And where you walk, I will walk was her response. Where uh, where you sleep, I will sleep is her response. Because the Ami said there's this there's a halach of yichud. So she said, where, where you sleep, I will sleep. And then Naomi says, we have 613 mitzvahs. So Naomi, so Rus said, your people are my people. And then she said, idol worship is forbidden to us. So Rus said, your God is my God. And then she saw she was making an effort to go with her. She stopped talking to her, meaning to stop discouraging her. On the basis of this concept that the verse is speaking of Ruth's conversion, a fine interpretation is handed down in the name of the Gon of Vilna. In the tractate above Mitzia, it is related that the great Amora Reish Lakish had at what time been a highwayman, and Rabbi Yochanan brought him under the wings of the Torah. After after, ta after having taken upon himself the yoke of Torah, Reish Lakish attempted to leap across the Jordan River, just as he previously done, and found that he can no longer do so, since, as Rashi explained, once he has taken upon himself the yoke of Torah, his physical strength was diminished. The Gon relates this to the story of Rus. She, too, having wholeheartedly taken upon herself to convert, found her physical strength diminished, and she can no longer walk quickly as before. That's why the Pasuk says, that Naomi saw she was making an effort to go, and she and she sees speaking to her. When Naomi perceived that it was now an effort for Ruth to walk, she understood that her daughter-in-law had truly undertaken to convert. So, for whatever reason, there's a uh, 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 acceptance of the yoke of Torah in this case of the Gemara and Ru, of and of and the, of Rus or our Gemara, the boys learning Torah. They are somewhat weak. There's an interesting book. I might have it at home, but I don't know where inside of two volumes of it. I don't know where inside these two volumes it would be. Um, uh, what's his name? Rav Yaakov Emden. Rav Yaakov Emden wrote an interesting uh, autobiography of his life, and in it he mentioned things along the same lines that because he was sitting and learning, he wasn't so healthy. So uh, why exactly it is, I don't know. However, it does seem that um, Yaakov Ishtam, Yosheva Alam, this week's Parsha, they didn't have recess in those days. The boys didn't have time to run around. When they were in Cheder, they were learning. There was no recess, no running around. So it could be because they literally didn't get that much physical activity, they weren't so healthy. Uh, Zev Aleph, who you, was at, at uh, HTC, and, that, and now he left to Philadelphia, 
he, or maybe he and a different uh, research uh, uh, friend of his, they mentioned that uh, when certain European uh, Rabbanim came to United States, let's say before World War II, to raise money, they were they were so very surprised to see the boys playing ball, uh, uh, like at recess. So to them, it seemed it was a very strange thing that uh, that uh, the boys were were playing ball. Obviously, they didn't play ball in Europe, but to be running around, you'd think that maybe that did happen. And then in the Art Scroll Rav Gusman book, it mentions that uh, something straight that uh, in Grodno, where, where Shimon Shkup was, so the boys would take um, pieces of metal and they would bend it with their hands. But then there was a certain boy who was super, uh, a good learner, not just a boy. He said, you think it's something to uh, to take a piece and and uh, and bend it, take a bent piece and make it straight. That's much harder. You have to be much stronger to do that. So from that, again, that's in the, the 1900s, you know, in that case, they were strong with their hands. So what exactly the situation was where when they're unhealthy, when they were healthy, I don't know exactly. But the, we see that from this uh from from this Gemara, Am Rabbi Yosi Bar Chanina, Beushe Iskino, Shaisha Shemarcha Benichzim, Glo Bechayim Baila Umeisa. So, uh, if a woman sold the Nichzim Alug, the Nichzim Alug was the stuff we've been talking about. So it's it's property, real estate that she can that she owns, but her husband is allowed to use the residual income that's coming in from it. So if she sold it. While her husband was still alive, Umesa, so it was in the Ksuva. So it's the so the thing is, it's in the Ksuva that she's bringing this in. So it's in the Ksuva that the husband's going to have these what we what do you call derivatives or what's the right accounting term for this, Larry? For this this revenue stream from this the the revenue generating property, let's call it. Is there a better term for it in accounting? No, it's not rent, but let's say there's a field, it's an orange grove. So every year when they have the oranges, he can make money off the oranges, but he's not allowed to put, make a mortgage on the field or he's not allowed to rent out the field. He can only use the the income that the, that the, that the, that this thing is generating. No. Sharecropping. Not necessarily sharecropping, but he's, he's not allowed to touch the principal, the field itself, but the, the income that the field generates he, the husband gets and it's in the ksuva that she's bringing this in so what if she sells it while he's alive so she's depriving him of this income stream that was promised him in the in the ksuva the husband is allowed to take it out of the purchasers because he has first rights on it uh not that he was standing in a gathering of people in Usha. Amar le man mara deshmaitzu de Usha. Who is the the master who taught us this teaching of the Usha about the one that we just said about if the woman sold the nichsim alug field, the husband's allowed to take it back. Amar le Rabbi Chia Bar Yosi. Amar le Rabbi Yosi Bar Chanina. The author is Rabbi Yosi Bar Chanina. Tanamine arba in zimnin. So he reviewed this forty times to not forget it. Vedami le keman demachna sele bechise. And it was like to someone who had something in his pocket. So this Gemara is a very uh, uh, important Gemara when people talk about the importance of Chazara reviewing. Um, reviewing. So he heard this halacha and he re reviewed it 40 times. So it's like something that's in your pocket, meaning something in your pocket is easily accessible to you. Unless you're like, well, what pocket did I put my keys in? It happens to me all the time then it's not so accessible. But in this case, he learned it 40 times, so he knew it well enough. It's always accessible to him. It's as if it was in his pocket. So they talk about this as the, the requirement of, of Chazara. So the, I, I think the arts girl brings down in here that there is a machlokas of what he learned. Does the arts girl say that? Oh, it's in, yeah, note 30. It says, did he, did he review the halacha 40 times? That if the if the wife sold the nechse malug, the husband could take it from the kuchos, or he didn't know who was the author of it. So once he knew the author of it, he reviewed that fact forty times. It seems that there's a little bit of a machlokus about that, or possible difference. Okay, so at this stage, 
because we keep talking about some of these things in Xuva, I figure we might as well look at Xuva right now. So we see, well, so obviously there's different additions that people can add in Xuva. We've mentioned several times dollar amounts that in Israel, they change. In America, we never change, sorry. So here's an English. Xuva is basically written in Aramaic. And here's an English translation. So the beginning is just date, location, and the chasen Nikala's name. So on whatever day of the week, whatever day of the month, in the year, whatever, the, the place that we count here in this city, whatever. Uh, the chasen Shmiro ben Beryl said to the Kala, you know, uh, Rivka Baslava, uh, Bas Basuel, Havi Leila into Kedas Moshe. So I'll be my wife according to the laws of Moshe in Israel, and I will work for you, esteem you. So I mean, va'oker is like give you respect or honor. So that's the word here, esteem. That's what it means. And I will feed you and support you according to the halachos, which I mean, in this case, it's not necessarily the laws, but it's the practices. So the word custom here is, is a good translation of the Jewish men who work and honor or and feed and support their wives uh, honestly so they faithfully means with with it's it's it means that they that they mean it the avina lihi marbus ulaihi kazuzin i will give you according to so this is where if she's a basula a first time marriage and she's a virgin she'll get 200 zuz if she was previously married she gets 100 zuz so if if it's if it, if it's uh she's a basula the 200 we write that you so here they just have a big a big uh so it has I give you and it's a blank, but there's actually it's an important part of the suva that we have to fill in when we're filling the suva. So at the at the CRC basin, there there once or twice uh, a husband says, you know, my suva was was it was just a form and we just filled in a few lines. How come we have to write the whole thing for the get? Do can't we have one that you just fill in the names? So I told him it's a very good question, but the halacha is is that is that the get has to be written uh, because of law. It has to be lishma. The whole thing has to be written for your sake, for your for your wife's sake, and for the sake of gerachin. And it has to be written with stuff that's yours. But ksuva doesn't have that requirement. If you were actually uh, being uh, makadesh, a woman with a star, it would have to be written like a get, meaning it has to be his property. It has to be written lishmo and lishma and lishem kedushin. But this ksuva, it, it, when we when we give the ksuva, we're not he's not marrying her with the ksuva. He married her with the ring, and the ksuva is just an obligation. So if she gets the two hundred zuz, we write it that that you get midiraisa, and if it's not her first wedding, we say it's your one hundred zuz that you get midirabanan, and your food. Okay, so that's back here in the translation: your food and clothing and necessities and your co conjugal rights, according to the accepted. Custom, so we'll see Gemara's later on. I think it's in Ksuvos. Uh, is it in Ksuvos? I'm not sure, but they said people with different professions might have different schedules for how often this would take place. And the bride has uh, agreed to be his wife, and this dowry that she brought from. So if she's if if if. Uh, so if she's is her first marriage and her father's alive, we would say from her father's house. If it's not her first marriage, we would say from her own house. Or if she's, let's say, if uh, a gioras, so her father wouldn't be providing her with, with uh, the dowry, we could also say from her herself, or we'd just cross out that line completely. Whether it's silver, whether it's gold, whether it's tachshitin, uh, furnishings, the money delvusha's clothing, they write bedding. I don't know, but money lavusha is more like clothing. But I guess they think like uh, the whoever translated this ksuva, which again, it's not a bad translation. Um, but I guess they say like a shower when you have a shower for the bride, you need know, stuff they need in the house. So it would be household furnishings, not her personal clothing furnishings. Bishimushi dira for housewares. Bishimushi de arsa. What is arsa? I don't, I'm not sure that I like their translation here.
a bed. So they, they missed a few words translating here. Vimele de Arsa is bedding stuff, stuff related to a bed. All of it, the groom has accepted with this for a hundred zoos, and he will, and he's uh, is adding from his own another hundred uh, uh, a silver uh, equal to them for a, a sum of two hundred uh, two hundred zoos. So that's for a basula. If it was a, a a widow or a divorcee, we would do fifty and fifty for a total of a hundred. So we don't write anything specific as a dowry is what she's bringing into the marriage. But it's clear from what we saw, I think, two weeks ago and from what we're talking and last week in this is that if you're bringing in Nechse Malug, that would be written into the Ksuva over here as part of the Nadunya, part of the dowry that she's bringing in. And it's possible, like I said, I, I don't really know what the Ksuvas are in Israel, but it's possible that they would actually add in more details here. In the in the United States here, we really don't change this at all. We just keep this. The, the, we just we don't change any of this. Yeah. Why doesn't it mention location? Unlike it does there. at the beginning. It does mention the location. It's in the. Uh, the you see, as we reckon time here in blank, the third line, the very third line, the first thing on the line is a blank is a blank line. Oh, you. Is that you mentioned the place where you are. You do mention the place. Um, so, and so said the, and, and so the, the groom said the responsibility, the obligation for this ksuva, the dowry, and this additional part. So the additional meaning he had a hundred and there's a dowry and he's giving another hundred. So that's the additional sum I accept upon myself and my heirs after me to be paid from all the best part of my property that I now possess or may hereafter require real and personal. So meaning the real property that's where we're going to talk about that more than tomorrow. We don't have that much time. We may not get there today, but we've spoken in the past. Real property is con is considered up. Uh, it's called in the Gemara the Islan Achrayos. It has responsibility. Responsibility means it could be tracked and this and that. Certain debts can be tied, like a mortgage, to a certain piece of property. So if you had sold the property, but then someone came in with this with this loan document that you owe the money, they can take the property from uh, the person you had sold it to, and obviously uh, you would have to pay them back for it because you can't pay two loans with one piece of property. So if, he, if you sold it to him and it was ready mortgage, you're going to have to pay him back for it, but... But the uh, person who who owned the the uh, who had this this uh, loan against you would take the property and property that doesn't have achrayas, which in, I transfer responsibility. That may not be the best uh, thing, but that would be movable property. It's not real estate, so it's easily transferred from person to person. So you can't keep track of that. You can't say I'm I'm lending you money, and if and if you don't pay me back, I'm going to take your watch. I mean, there's this idea of a collateral. You take a watch as a collateral, but you can't take a movable property, a movable object as to mortgage a, a loan to. You can only use real estate for that. Uh, from So they translate as real and personal, but the main thing is personal means movable property. Uh, all of them will be responsible and... Uh, so they were mortgaged and leaned. Okay, that's not bad. Uh, well, to pay from them the this uh, ksuva star, this dowry, and the addition from me, even from the shirt on my back when I live, and even after my lifetime, from today on, and the responsibility and the content of this ksuva star. The dowry and the additional sum, uh, the, the additional sum, has been accepted upon the, the groom accepted upon himself with the strictness. So they say strictness. A chumrah is a strictness, but kachomer, chomer is also like a, a form or a substance. So we could say that the form that this star is the same, just like any other star is binding. This star is also binding. 
So I, I, I'm not sure I like the, the word here, strictness. I think it means that the, the way that forms are, that contracts are written up, this is a contract like any other contract. All of the, all other uh, Suvos contracts and additional things that are customs for the daughters of Jew, uh, of the Jewish people that are made according to the, uh, the Takanos of the Chachamim, and it's not an Asmachta, uh, so they translate a, a formality or as a perfunctory legal form. So there is a halachic thing that if you do something that's really fake, it doesn't really mean anything. So uh, some people tend to forget that when you sell your chametz, they think it's kind of a fake thing. But we have to remind them, no, it's a real thing. It's not a fake thing. So an asmachta is something that's kind of a fake thing. And we're saying this is not a fake thing. There's a discussion. A lot of Rishonim say, if you write in the star, this is not an asmachta, that doesn't make it real. Just to say it's not fake doesn't make it real. And it's not like the contents. So Ketov Se Deshtare, so they're saying a perfunctory legal form. And we have established the acceptance. So this is the part in the Ksuva, the word Kanina means he made a Kenyan. So what's the Kenyan? We we usually a handkerchief, a Chalipan contract. He accept upon himself everything in here. So even when the even though we used a we use a a a, 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 a ksuva that's that's pre written and we just fill in the blanks, the the usually the kuf, the the long part of the kuf in the word kanina we is left out and when he's ready to die then we fill that 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 uh, leg in of the kuf. Uh, so he had the we we have saw a, a kenyan from so and so the chasan to the to miss. Uh, you know, whatever her name is, who is the bride, and everything which is written and specified above, in a form that's in a in a in a way that's proper to make a kenyan. So they wrote an article fit for that purpose means you did the kenyan in the proper way, and everything is valid and binding, and signed by two witnesses. So that is that's the ksuva. So I figure, I I because we don't do this, so I don't know that if there'd be a nechse malug, it would be put in by the dowry. So because it would be included, that he'd be getting the 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 uh, the income generating part of these fields, that gives him a certain right to it. So we'll leave it here. But to the point, so one thing I'm just going to mention here, I'm not going to talk about it all, but mention is that so when you know in about 40 years ago or maybe a little more than 40 years ago when people are saying that there's okay i'm letting me start stop the recording here